The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Something that Pope Francis has talked a lot about and has called our consciences to accountability for is the sins of omission. Everybody should not give a dime to all of these bad bishops. Make sure that all of your money goes directly into the hands of good orders and good activities, but never throw it into a general pot. I think Bishop Shifu and Morlino were absolutely right to call for the Senate to be canceled, but unfortunately it plowed ahead. This has to be renewed in seminary life because of the dominant culture culture, which doesn't recognize chastity any more than it recognizes charity. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and this Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that we might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Friends, our topic today is twofold, looking at Our Lady in Scripture and in prophecy. In this segment, we're going to be looking at Our Lady in terms of Scripture. Our guest is Dr. Edward Sri, an author, a scholar, a theologian, vice president of formation for Focus Ministries. And you can look at his website, edwardsri.com, Edward S R I. Dot com, author of the book Rethinking Mary in the New Testament. Dr. Sri, welcome to the Catholic Current. Thanks for having me. Uh, Dr. Sri, some folks might object. He says, why uh, write a book, write a sizable book about Mary in the New Testament? She really didn't say very much. If you take every reference to Our Lady in the New Testament, it would be on, on a, si- uh, a sheet of a piece of paper. Uh, what, what's going on with your book here? Oh, that's why I call it Rethinking Mary in the New Testament, because I want people to rethink this. It reminds me of okay. years ago, I was giving a presentation in Kansas City, and a number of Protestant pastors kindly showed up, and they were really interested. And But one of them asked that kind of question. They said, Dr. Shree, you know, Mary only appears twice in the Gospel of John, so why, do, why, why is there so much emphasis in the Catholic Church on her if she only appears two times? And I said, you know what? I get that. If, if you're going to do a quantitative analysis, how many times does she appear? You know, other people like St. Paul or, or Peter or the Pharisees, you know, they, they appear more than Mary does. You know, why do the Catholics give so much attention to her? But if you do a qualitative analysis, there's a whole different story there. When you oh, tell Mary us more about appears, that. Yeah, she appears at crucial moments, right? In John's Gospel, the two points are the wedding at Cana, which is the beginning of his public ministry, when his glory is revealed for the first time, and then at the cross, which is the climax of his mission. And so she appears at crucial junctures in the life of Christ. But when we look at those passages, and this is what I tried to do in the book, is we we can unpack the, the, the words that are there, and we're going to find that there are many prophecies in the background of these passages, many Jewish expectations, a lot of rich theology to help us understand who this woman was, what she was going through, and most of all, the important role she plays in God's plan of salvation. So I would argue there's a lot more there than it first meets the eye, and a lot more there than, than many times our Protestant brothers and sisters may see, but I would say even our many Catholic theologians and teachers may not recognize fully all that's in these rich biblical passages. If I could give one analogy. It's like yes, please. Movie. I would say these passages are like walking through a biblical minefield. You know, every step of the way, there's just beautiful prophecies, hopes, expectations, and uh, connections that are being wonderfully blowing up all around us. Uh, And and that's what I try to do in the book. I cover every key New Testament uh, reference to Mary. I have a whole chapter just on the word hail, the angel's opening word to Mary, or a whole chapter on full of grace, the second word to Mary. There's just so much in each of these words, and, and, and I think they can tell us a lot about who she was and her role in her life today. You, you know, Dr. Sri, I, I one of the reasons I, I found your book uh, appealing is that it asks us to slow down 
and to spend time with Mary and to spend time with her in, in the scriptures. I, I think that very often there's a lazy or thoughtless approach uh, to Mary. We already know everything about her because we've seen so many holy cards, or we assume that there's really nothing uh, interesting that can be known about her at all. And it seems to me we, we want to avoid uh, two errors. And one error is to make Mary so exalted that she's not really human uh, she's not anyone we can identify with or, or, or get to know. She's just the unicorn in the hagiographical zoo that we appreciate from a distance. The other is to make Mary so utterly ordinary that she's just some girl from a small town who needs to be liberated by, by angry feminism. Those are both obvious errors. How can a, a slow, meditative approach to Scripture uh, help us discover Mary and avoid the mistakes I described? Yeah, I, I think I, one of the, I have a whole chapter just on one little line, one of my favorite about Mary in the Bible. It comes in Luke 2.19, uh, that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, that idea of keeping and pondering, is, now that's Mary's own example. She's watching the events unfold around her, the mysterious events. This child is supposed to be the Son of God. He's born in these austere, poor conditions. He has to be put in a manger. All of a sudden, shepherds show up, announcing they saw an angel. She's, there's all these uh, this perplexing things happening at the birth of her son. And her first response is to go interior. She wants to ponder it. And the expression, to keep and ponder... It, it, it describes someone that experiences a mysterious event or gets a mysterious revelation, and they're mulling it over. They're pr- it's as if they're prayerfully asking God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? And I think that Marian disposition is, is not just important for, uh, for, for understanding Mary and not just important for understanding the Scriptures, but just for life, that when yes. events unfold around us and... You know, a difficult situation happens at work, or a health issue, or a financial issue at home, and we're wondering, what's going on, Lord? Where are you in this? Do we immediately go to, how do I solve the problem, or do we go interiorly and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? I want to fix See, the problem, that's, but I believe that's such an important you can point. make something good. You know, when I was a, a Jesuit novice and I was given that passage, you know, man, Mary pondering those things in her heart, it was, it was one of the most decisive meditations that ever been given by, by a retreat director because there's a habit and a way of life there that is so contrary to the manic pace and the utilitarian attitude uh, of the contemporary world. Uh, in, in your book, Rethinking Mary in the New Testament, I, I found especially fascinating uh, the depictions uh, of Mary uh, in the Apocalypse. And I I know there are some skeptical scholars who harumph and that any reference to the woman in the desert, etc., etc., that's really the church and doesn't have anything to do with Mary at all. Uh, what, what can you tell our, our listeners about that? Yeah, there's a lot of debate about this woman in Revelation 12. Uh, we just had her in the reading uh, in, in, in many times throughout the year. We, this passage right. comes up on Mary and Feast Days. Um, but this this, this this mysterious woman appears crowned with 12 stars. She's clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. Who is this woman? Uh, I think one important detail is this. She gives birth to a male child, and the male mm-hmm. child in verses 5 and 6 is described as someone who is caught up to the throne of God as he's being attacked by the dragon. He's caught up to the throne of God and protected, and then he's also described as ruling all nations with a rod of iron, which is an expression right out of the Old Testament prophecy in Psalm 2 about the Messiah, the future anointed one, will rule all nations with a rod of iron. So who is this child? It's clearly the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus, the one fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 2, the one who's caught up to a throne in heaven, and he sits at the right hand of the Father in his ascension. So no, you know, the, 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 it's very clear, the child is the Messiah. So then you just ask, well, who's the mother of the Messiah? Who gave birth to the Messiah? And it's pretty clear it's Mary. Now, I, I get there's a lot of reasons why we should see the woman also as a symbol of the Church or a symbol of Israel. There's a lot of biblical points that support that. But to exclude Mary from this altogether does not make any sense. As one of my favorite New Testament scholars asks, is it conceivable that someone in the first century Christian world could talk about the mother of, Messiah, of the Messiah and not think about Mary at all? <laughs> it's just, right. like, of course you're going to think of Mary, um, especially someone from the Johannine tradition, right? Uh, so, 
so I think clearly the woman's Mary. She stands as a, you know, if there's ever a woman, one woman in the Bible who could represent both Old Testament Israel and the New Testament Church, it's Mary. So she can she can represent both roles. But once we see that this woman in Revelation 12 really is Mary, it tells us a lot. She's got the 12 stars. She's a queen. It tells us that in verse 17 of that, of that chapter, she's the mother of all those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. In other words, she's the mother, not just of the Messiah, but of all faithful disciples, obedient to God, bearing witness to Christ. Uh, She's the spiritual mother of all Christians. I I think there's a lot of rich theology in Revelation 12 about Our Lady. Once you can identify, yes, indeed, we can see Mary in this woman. Uh, Dr. Sri, you know, there were so many uh, authenticated apparitions of, of Our Lady in the course of history. For our present times, which are, are, are difficult, is there any particular apparition we, our listeners should pay special attention to? Oh, wow. I mean, certainly, I would say two. The one is Fatima, of course, which we've been thinking about in recent years, so just recently celebrating the 100th anniversary, you know, of the great challenges that the world and the Church was going to face, and how Mary's asking us to make reparation and to turn to her and to pray the rosary, and not just pray it when it's convenient, but pray it daily, to make a commitment to pray the rosary daily. It's a beautiful biblical prayer that brings us through the life of Jesus. The words themselves are from Scripture. So I would, you know, I think uh, Our Lady of Fatima is an important one. I also think Our Lady of Guadalupe for our country. Um, you know, we think about in the, the troubled times in Mexico, uh, way back when she was yes. appearing, where millions of people being sacrificed and killed, a, cult, a true culture of darkness and culture of death. And then Our Lady appears and millions of conversions. Uh, and a, and a culture is starting to be transformed. We need that in our own culture of darkness and death today. Dr. Street, thank you for your testimony of faith. Friends, I recommend to you the book of Dr. Edward Street, Rethinking Mary in the New Testament. Look for his website, Edward Street, edwardsri.com. When we come back, we're going to talk about rediscovering Our Lady in, in prophecy and apparitions. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line, one 511 5483 Stay with us. We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. The Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you'll join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Station of the Cross. If you're new to iCatholic Radio, welcome to the free mobile app of the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. It's available for download on your Android and Apple mobile devices. If you have any questions about your new app, please contact us at thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. That's thestationofthecross.com or 1-877-888-6279. Through your new app, you can listen to podcasts of shows, conference talks, and prayers. View our programming grid, call us directly, and check out our mobile website. You can even learn how you can promote iCatholic Radio in your community. Connect with us through social media and financially support the programming you love. That's all available on your iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for joining our iCatholic Radio family, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. If you're looking for a great resource to give your spiritual life a boost, sign up for the free e-newsletter of the Station of the Cross. It'll come to your inbox each month and include stories of the saints, station news, our Holy Father's prayer intentions for the month, and what's trending on Twitter in the Catholic world. Sign up today to start receiving your free e-newsletter. On your computer or mobile device, go to thestationofthecross.com. That's thestationofthecross.com. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. 
Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is Mary in Scripture and Prophecy, a suitable topic for the Christmas season, I'd say. Our first guest was Dr. Edward Shree, and we discussed his book, Rethinking Mary in the New Testament. And at the end of that segment, we talked about Our Lady in Prophecy and Apparitions. We have a guest with us, an independent journalist and expert in Mariology, Brendan Young. Welcome back to The Catholic Current. Thank you, Father. It's great to be back. Brendan, you heard Dr. Shri at the end of the last segment when I asked him about the most important apparitions of Our Lady for our time, and he mentioned Guadalupe, uh, which we celebrated just a few weeks ago, and Fatima, of course, and a number of our readers in our survey uh, agreed that Fatima is the most important uh, apparition, perhaps, in in the history of, of Mariology. It's an apparition that's well known. We know that Our Lady has asked us to pray the rosary daily, to do penance, to wear the scapular. But we're going to talk today about uh, an apparition that's probably not as well known to most of our listeners. How will you introduce this for us? Well, Father, um, you've mentioned Guadalupe, which was, as far as we know, the first recorded apparition of Our Lady to take place in the New World. But uh, so Mexico, of course, was a Spanish colony. But shortly after the apparition of uh, Our Lady at Guadalupe in Mexico, we go down to Ecuador in the 1500s, so the mid and late 1500s and early 1600s in uh, Quito, Ecuador. And we have the apparitions of Nuestra Señora de Buen Suceso, who has come to be known in English as Our Lady of Good Success. So these apparitions are, as you mentioned, Father, not so well known, and there's a reason for that that we'll get into. And the apparitions of Our Lady of Good Success uh, took place in the monastery of the Immaculate Conception, and it was a monastery that was and is um, a community of conceptionist nuns. So not too many people are familiar. Uh, Here in Buffalo, of course, we have cloistered, Discalced Carmelite nuns, we have cloistered Dominican nuns, and there are several other orders, uh, like the Poor Clares of Perpetual Adoration, Mother Angelica's order. These are very well known um, throughout our community locally and also throughout the church, but not too many people know about the Conceptionist nuns. And the order, the Immaculate Conception, was founded at Our Lady's request in 1484 by St. Beatriz de Silva, and uh, Our Lady actually appeared to St. Beatrice, or uh, Beatrix in English, and she appeared wearing the habit of the order that was adopted by those sisters, a white habit with a blue mantle. Uh, but probably the most famous religious of this Conceptionist Order Father uh, would be Blessed Maria of Agreda, who is uh, a great mystic in her own right, and she's most famous for writing uh, or compiling, really, the mystical city of God, those uh, private revelations on the lives of our Lord and our Lady. And and Blessed Maria bilocated, not too many people know that she bilocated, and she evangelized the Humano Indians in New Mexico and Texas, and this was also in the 1600s. Um, But getting back to Quito, Ecuador, in 1576, uh, six conceptionist nuns had arrived from Spain. They had been requested... Uh, by the um, by, some pious women of Quito, and we should clarify, like um, you know, so many other towns and cities and missions in California. For example, we have San Francisco in California. Well, Quito's full name was and is San Francisco de Quito, so Saint Francis of Quito. And of course, because the Franciscan missionaries had um, gone there in the very beginning of the city. And so named it uh, in honor of their Holy Father, their Seraphic Father, St. Francis. But these six nuns had arrived in 1576 from Spain. 
um, the conceptionist nuns who had been requested by local pious women to come and make a foundation there. And um, along with these six nuns, uh, their abbess was named Mother Maria of Jesus, but she was accompanied by her, her niece, who was named Mariana. And Mariana was 13 years old at the time, and she was already a um, a mystic, if you will. She had already received mystical favors, because at that time, before the reign of Pope St. Pius X, children were not allowed to receive their first Holy Communion until they were teenagers. But Mariana was so um, united with our Lord that she was permitted by her spiritual director to receive uh, her first communion at nine years old. And when she made her first communion, Our Lady told her that she would enter her conceptionist order. And later on, when she was about 13, 12 or 13, Our Lord instructed her to go to the New World, so to, to Quito, and uh, to enter the conceptionist order there. So Mariana had made this voyage with her aunt, Mother Maria of Jesus, who was the first abbess. And um, during this voyage, so already this young girl, uh, you know, we can think also of Padre Pio, of uh, Pietro Cina, St. Pio, who had also received special mystical favors from a very young age. During this, this sea voyage, which took months, uh, there was a terrible storm. And the devil cried out during the storm, I will not permit the foundation, that is the foundation of the Conceptionist Monastery in Quito, I will not allow it to develop, I will not allow it to last until the end of time, and I will persecute it at every moment. You know, Brendan, I just interject just for a moment. Uh, as as I was reading the history of, of the revelations in the monastery, it seems that the devil raged against this monastery in, in particular time and again. He he actively intervened to try to destroy that. I, I think that's noteworthy as we, we uh, uh, have this history unfold. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, Father, if perhaps I've I've given a little too much background, but it's important to have this, I think, in order to understand the the importance and the really extraordinary role that this monastery and Mother Mariana and, of course, especially, above all, Our Lady of Good Success have and will continue to have for our church and our world. So um, if I can just go, go ahead, back. Please. So yes. Mother, Mother, well, the future Mother Mariana, um, as I mentioned, was just 13. And so... Um, she um, accompanied the, the religious, uh, as I had mentioned, and when she reached uh, 15 years of age, she received the habit and became a novice, and then she uh, professed her perpetual vows. And at the time of her perpetual vows, our Lord had told her that she would uh, have much to suffer, she uh, was presented actually with a um, with the cross, as well as as uh, um, a very special ring, and already she was embracing this particular vocation of hidden suffering. And we find out then that this vocation of suffering that Mother Mariana embraced so heroically was for our own times. Uh, and again. These apparitions are so little known, but they're so very important. And eventually, Mother Mariana became the novice mistress of her, of her uh, monastery. And uh, Father, if I could be permitted a little um, a personal bracket here, or footnote. Yes, I was please. I was privileged to visit this monastery um, two, almost two years ago. So I was there for two weeks in, in Quito, Ecuador, for the novena and the feast of Our Lady of Good Success. And part of that um, involved a special permission on the part of the abbess to uh, enter the enclosure and to spend time in the upper choir, which was the uh, privileged place of these apparitions, and to also venerate the incorrupt body of Mother Mariana. And by uh, an even more special permission, I was allowed to touch the incorrupt body, which is preserved in a beautiful golden uh, and glass urn. But oh, this, what a great privilege. It was a really great privilege that I didn't deserve, but that I was bold enough to ask for. But um, this monastery, Father, is so, um, is so extraordinary, as I mentioned, that all of the founderses, foundresses, 
uh, so that would be six, are incorrupt to this day, 400 mm. years later. We know of St. Bernadette, of St. John Marie Vianney, of St. Catherine Labouré, of St. Vincent de Paul, and, and so many other uh, incorrupt saints in our Catholic Church. But we don't know, uh, and, and they're few and far between, but we don't know of these, of these beautiful um, flowers of virtue and religious perfection that exist in our own, uh, we can say, part of the world, the new world. And so there are six incorrupt foundresses besides Mother Mariana. And Mother Mariana is the only one who is exposed. The others are hidden. Uh, that is to say that the veils are drawn over their faces because they aren't uh, uh, blessed or saints, and so public mm -hmm. veneration of them is not yet allowed. And then there are five other incorrupt religious that are known to be buried in the enclosure. Oh. So, I mean, 11 or 12 uh, incorrupt um, uh, saints, well, future saints, saints uh, that we will come to know in heaven if not here on earth, uh, in one place that's really extraordinary. And mm -hmm. the entire city, the old city of San Francisco de Quito, Quito is just steeped and rich in, in um, history, and especially um, of the religious orders, the Augustinians, Franciscans, Dominicans, Carmelites, and on and on, Mercedarians. And I had a chance to soak that all in myself. And oh, so my. Mother Mariana then, as I mentioned, Father, sorry for that uh, pretty lengthy aside, became the novice mistress of her community because she just excelled in, and uh, grew in virtue so quickly. And um, eventually, because of her virtue, because of her really striving despite the uh, discomfort and the sacrifice that it entailed, pursuing religious perfection and holiness in her beautiful vocation, even at a very young age, uh, she and, and other sisters, including her aunt, who were very observant, that is, ob observing their rule and their constitutions and their religious life, um, they became kind of thorns in the sides of sisters who uh, are, were certainly very saintly compared to ourselves, but they were not going all out. They hadn't totally embraced their vocation, and they had grown lax. And so... The, the community was divided in the observant sisters and the non-observant sisters. Um, a kind of a similar situation that drove St. Teresa of Avila to found the Descalce Carmelites uh, in Spain. But um, this kind of revolt in, in the monastery, the Conceptionist Monastery in Quito, led to this faction, and, and we'll get more um, into that when we come back. Okay. We're talking with Brendan Young, independent journalist and Mariologist, about... Our Lady in Prophecy and Apparitions, in particular, 16th century apparition in Ecuador. When we come back, we're going to talk about prophecies from that apparition that apply to the 20th century and our times. And we want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now and call us, 1-877-511-5483. Text us the same number, 1-877-511-5483. After the show, go to thestationofthecross.com, download the audio as podcast, we're also available on most major platforms, including iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern for Sermons for Everyday Living, a program that brings you real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Visit thestationofthecross.com for details. Prayer of Deliverance Almighty God and Father, we beg Thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore Thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. 
from every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Do you ever wonder where God is in your suffering or what His will is for you as you struggle in the faith? Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, a program to inspire you and offer solutions to many of life's challenges. Mother Miriam is a Catholic nun and convert from Judaism whose humor and holiness, along with years of theological training, bless all who are in need of encouragement and practical advice. Listen on your local Station of the Cross affiliate or on our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. That's Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam, weekdays from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is Mary and Scripture and Prophecy. We began the hour with Dr. Edward Shree discussing his new book, Rethinking Mary in the New Testament, and then we picked up the conversation with independent journalist Brendan Young talking about Our Lady not in terms of the better known uh, apparitions Guadalupe or Fatima but a little known 16th century apparition in Ecuador Our Lady under the title of Our Lady of Good Success Brendan you had given us some background on the foundation of, of the, the monastery and the, and the order and, and some of the major players in, in this story and pretty soon the major players ran into opposition. What can you tell us about that? Yes, Father. So as I had mentioned before we, we breaked that there was this division within the conceptionist community of Quito between the observant sisters, those who wanted to really radically live religious life and all of its observance, all of its rigor and fervor, and then the non-observant sisters who... Uh, wanted to be a little more lax, we can say. So what it what 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 it came what the situation came down to was that um, the the faction of the non-observant sisters was led by a sister who has come to be known uh, by her nickname that was given to her then as La Capitana or the Captain, and so La Capitana led these sisters in opposition uh, to uh, Sister or Mother Mariana of Jesus and the observant sisters. And ultimately, uh, what, it, what had been already prophesied had taken place, that the conceptionist nuns who uh, were under the jurisdiction of the Franciscan friars um, were, were then, um, re, we can say, taken out of that jurisdiction, out of that direction by the local bishop, and became autonomous. And so the Franciscan friars who had been ensuring the uh, the very good and faithful religious observance were out of the picture. And so the lax sisters then um, took charge of the convent and uh, imprisoned Mother Mariana in the convent prison. So I, I should clarify this, Father, because some people can uh, could very well be asking now, why would there be a prison in a cloistered monastery? And it, was, it wasn't like a prison that we would uh, think of today in, in today's terms. Nuns um, were deprived of their veil. 
They were deprived of their bravery, their divine office. Um, they were given a time out. Right. It was like a time okay. out, a religious so time they, out. So they, they were given a time out. And I, I think that the key for, for this history are the uh, what Our Lady said, and this is in the 16th century when Ecuador was just a colony, about things that would take place uh, in the north in the 20th century. What can you tell us about that? Sure. So... Uh, Again, Father, these are such extraordinary um, circumstances and apparitions that um, Mother Mariana then was given the choice, and she willingly chose this, Father, for the conversion of that sister who came to be known as La Capitana. Mother Mariana was asked to suffer the pains of hell. So it's something that we can't comprehend. How could this take place? But by God's... um, incredible and um, mysterious design, Mother Mariana willingly suffered the pains of hell for the conversion of that sister for five years, mm-hmm. um, which is really unprecedented. And she continued to go to Holy Communion under obedience to her spiritual director, but she suffered really, the, truly the pains of hell for such a long time and made it through it. Made, uh, we can't imagine this incredible pain. But even before this, Father, um, people might be asking, why aren't these apparitions known? And one of our listeners texted us to that effect right. just before the break. So, in the toward the beginning of of Mother Mariana's uh, mystical experiences in the convent, uh, the tabernacle opened. She was in prayer before the tabernacle, and the tabernacle opened, and our Lord appeared. Uh, he came out of the tabernacle, uh, appearing as Jesus crucified, along with Our Lady and Saint John and Saint Mary Magdalene, who were at the foot of the cross on Calvary. And Mother Mariana felt guilty, and and she saw our Lord in agony, and she asked Our Lady if she was guilty, if she was responsible for this. And Our Lady told her, you are not guilty, but rather the sinful world. And the Eternal Father's voice was heard, and he said, this punishment will be for the 20th century. And above our Lord's head, there were three swords, and on them were written heresy, blasphemy, and impurity. Heresy, blasphemy, and impurity that these would be the three major sins of our times. And certainly we have seen all of this come to pass. And, oh my goodness, yes. And part of the apparitions also, the messages that Mother Mariana received, was that Our Lady of Good Success, Our Lady under this title, would not be known until the 20th century, until our own times. And Mother Mariana was called, and she willingly accepted, to offer herself as a victim soul for the 20th century, for our own times. And so if people are wondering then why we don't know about Our Lady of Good Success as we do Fatima, Guadalupe, Lourdes, um, etc., that's why, because the message was actually meant to be hidden in God's mysterious design until our times. And uh, Father, Our Lady not only um, uh, revealed to Mother Mariana that... uh, heresy, blasphemy, and impurity uh, would be these these three sins and scourges of our time. But she also said quite uh, a lot about our times besides this. Um, she prophesied many things. She mm-hmm. said of our times that, for example, Ecuador did not exist as a country. It was still a colony, and Our Lady named Ecuador as becoming a country. She mm-hmm. prophesied concerning Ecuador that it would be consecrated to the sacred heart of her son by its president, by a truly virtuous and heroic president, who is Gabriel Garcia Moreno. Um, She prophesied that. She prophesied that Satan would reign, uh, that passions would erupt, and that Satan would reign by means of Freemasonry. She called it that wicked sect, but she prophesied this uh, furious and demonic activity of Freemasonry. And she also said that Freemasons and these sects would focus principally on children in order to sustain the corruption. And she, Our Lady said, and I'm quoting, it will be difficult to receive the sacrament of baptism and also the sacrament of confirmation. They will receive the sacrament of confession only if they remain in Catholic schools, for the devil will make a great effort to destroy it through persons in position of authority. The same thing will happen with the sacrament of Holy Communion. And Father, I can tell you, I went to Catholic grammar school locally here in in our Diocese of Buffalo, and we went to confession twice in the school year, at Advent Mm. and Lent. We had a kind of penance service and then individual confessions. 
And I have kept in touch with various friends that I had from those years in Catholic grade school and some in Catholic high school. And unfortunately, they have not been to confession since. And really, if uh, the sacrament of confession is only offered for 15 minutes on a Saturday afternoon, um, that really doesn't facilitate the sacrament. And if it's not being preached about and encouraged, then certainly it is going to disappear, as Our Lady has predicted. Uh Um, Our Lady went on to to tell Mother Mariana, uh, describing the many enormous sacrileges, both public as well as secret, that will occur that will occur occur from profanation of the Holy Eucharist. Uh. That uh, during this time, the enemies of Jesus Christ, instigated by the devil, will steal consecrated hosts from the churches so that they might profane the Eucharistic species. And we know, we, Father, we've seen hosts uh, land up on eBay. Uh, we've seen. Oh, I know, we've uh, seen Brendan. I've had are, to go through parishes after mass and check all the hymnals to see the people who received Holy Communion didn't know what they were doing, and and put the the consecrated host in in a hymnal or 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 un, under the pew. But I, I want to clarify for our listeners: these were things that Our Lady told Mother Mariana would take place in 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 the twentieth century. Yes, yes. Okay. And um, she went on to say that her son would see himself cast upon the ground and trampled upon by filthy feet. So mm-hmm. these these terrible profanations and sacrileges against our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, um, they continue through our day. I've seen it. Uh, Father, you've seen it. We, we've all seen it, unfortunately. These mm-hmm. unspeakable offenses against our Lord. And Our Lady also said that the sacrament of extreme unction or anointing of the sick will be little valued, that many people will die without receiving it, either because of the negligence of their families or misconceived affection for their sick ones. Father, you've been a priest now for over 20 years. I mean, you've yes. seen people, um, you know, the, the, the children don't want to call the priest because they're afraid to uh, frighten their mother or their father. Well, they'll right. see the priest and they'll realize they're dying. Well, what do you think? You don't think that they've already realized that they're dying, laying there in the hospital bed? Or right. the patient themselves doesn't want to call the priest because they don't want to bother their children. They don't want to worry their children. But Our Lady went on to say that others incited by the devil, the cursed devil, will rebel against the spirit of the Catholic Church and will deprive countless souls of innumerable graces, consolations, and the strength they need to make the great leap from time to eternity, referring to the sacrament of, of uh, extreme unction or anointing of the sick. But she went on to say concerning marriage, which we've seen certainly, um, as for the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and deeply profaned. Freemasonry, that wicked sect which will then be in power, will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with this sacrament making it easy for everyone to live in sin and encouraging the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. The Catholic spirit will rapidly decay. The precious light of faith will gradually be extinguished until there will be an almost total and general corruption of customs. Added to this will be the effects of secular education, which will be one reason for the death of priestly and religious vocations. So, Brent, I want to interject a question one of our listeners asked. Th- this, is a, this is an approved apparition. This is something that's been certified yes, by Father, the church as so, worthy of belief. Yes, it was uh, approved immediately by the local bishop, and uh, we're getting to the, uh, to, to the most beautiful manifestation of this apparition that was also approved by the local bishop. And, um, Father, just quickly, uh, which we've been experiencing this past year in our church, in our local diocese, across the country, and all over the world, this crisis in the clergy. Our Lady said that the sacrament of holy orders will be ridiculed, oppressed, and despised. For in this sacrament, the Church of God and even God himself is scorned and despised since he is represented in his priests. But this is, this is really um, talking of our time, of, of, of this year even. The mm-hmm. devil will try to persecute the ministers of the Lord in every possible way. He will labor with cruel and subtle astuteness to deviate them from the spirit of their vocation and will corrupt many of them. These depraved priests who will scandalize the Christian people will make the hatred of bad Catholics and the enemies of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church fall upon all priests. 
And Father, we've seen this come to pass with this crisis, this scandal. Um, unfortunately, the bad example of so many priests and bishops. Again, this refers to our own times. And, um, you know, how can we not uh, hear these words, read these words, and not think of what's going on locally and across our nation and throughout the universal church? To me, it's obvious. Well, you know, and the astonishing thing is, is this was taking place in the 16th century, and so much of this must have been beyond Mother Mariana's comprehension, you know, how things could have gotten to, to such a state. Right. Well, Father, we know that Mother Mariana was, uh, you know, received these revelations, and she offered herself again as a victim soul for our times in expiation and reparation for these particular sins. And you know, thanks be to God for those consecrated religious uh, victim souls, those who take seriously the admonitions for prayer and penance and reparation. I think there's keeping the sky from falling to buy time for the rest of us. When we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with Brendan Young about the apparitions of Our Lady in Ecuador in the 16th century. And we're going to talk about what we need to do now in terms of prayer and our times. We want you to be part of the conversation. Get on the line now to call us, one 877 51 one one five four eight three. Text us the same number one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. After the program, go to the station of the cross dot com. Download our audio as podcast. Find us on most major platforms. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Father Jacek Mazer. Please join me in a prayer honoring Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. O God, who by the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, you prepared a worthy dwelling place for your Son, we beseech you that, through her intercession, we may be purified from all sin. Amen. This is Franciscan Media's Saint of the Day for December 28th. Today we celebrate the Holy Innocents. Because he was unpopular with his people, Judea's King Herod the Great was insecure and fearful of any threat to his throne. A tyrant and master politician, the king was capable of extreme brutality. Matthew's Gospel recalls that Herod was greatly troubled when astrologers from the east came asking the whereabouts of the newborn king of the Jews, whose star they had seen. They were told that the Jewish scriptures named Bethlehem as the place where the Messiah would be born. Cunning and clever, Herod told them to report back to him so that he also could pay homage to the child. The wise men found Jesus and offered him their gifts, but an angel warned them to avoid Herod on their way home. Meanwhile, also warned by a dream, the Holy Family escaped to Egypt. Infuriated, Herod ordered the massacre of all boys two years old and under in Bethlehem and its vicinity. Since Bethlehem was a small town, the number of babies killed was likely between 20 and 26. The church honors these infants as holy martyrs who died for Christ by dying in his place. The new Saint of the Day app is available now for your smartphone or tablet. From Franciscan Media, this has been Saint of the Day. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after the show, visit our page for the Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. You'll find a link to today's episode page where you can view Father McTague's show resources and today's podcast. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network and the iCatholic Radio app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is Mary and Scripture and Prophecy. We began the hour with Dr. Edward Shree in his latest book, Rethinking Mary in the New Testament. We've taken up the conversation with independent journalist Brendan Young regarding Regarding a little-known apparition of Our Lady in Ecuador under the title of Our Lady of Good Success. 
And we ended the last segment talking about startling prophecies that Mother Mariana received in the 16th century that apply specifically to our time. Brendan, where, where do we go from here? What, you know, I know that Our Lady of Fatima asks us to wear the scapula to pray the rosary every day. Are there exhortations from Our Lady in Ecuador from Mother Mariana that our listeners should be aware of? There are, Father, and um, what it comes down to is devotion to Our Lady and more particularly devotion to Our Lady under this title, so Our Lady of Good Success. And the most beautiful, um, we can say, proof in our in our time, uh, the most beautiful uh, expression of this devotion is itself the miraculous statue of Our Lady of Good Success, which I've been privileged to, to see, to venerate, and to touch. And Our Lady requested Father of Mother, of Mother Mariana that this statue be made, and just an extraordinary account of how it how it came to be, and um, an artist had been commissioned to to make this statue, and Our Lady um, actually instructed Mother Mariana to take off her Franciscan cord, her cincture, and uh, she took it. Uh, Our Lady took it and raised it, and it miraculously extended itself. It grew, and so Mother Mariana used that cincture as a way to to measure Our Lady's height. And so the statue was made, and it was already beautiful, but uh, it wasn't as beautiful as Our Lady deserved, certainly. And um, during one of Mother Mariana's ecstasies in that upper choir loft of the, of the Conceptionist Convent, uh, during the following night, once the artist had finished, the three archangels, Saints Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, appeared along with St. Francis of Assisi, the patron of uh, and seraphic father of the Conceptionist nuns, and they completed the statue themselves. And Father, I've seen this statue. It is of such unique and extraordinary beauty that uh, if you lay your eyes on it, if you have that privilege, but even if you see it just in pictures or video, which are readily available online, you would believe that this was truly miraculously completed by the archangels and by St. Francis. And uh, again, during uh, the final apparitions of Our Lady, uh, Mother Mariana had uh, requested this, and it was also the will of Our Lady, that she would remain unknown and hidden until the 20th century. And it was really in the 1980s that the first um, information appeared in English about Our Lady of Good Success and Mother Mariana, and uh, books were translated and, and started coming out, and this devotion is really starting to flourish uh, and if you Google, Father, uh, for example, about the apostolate of Our Lady of Good Success um, in uh, Wisconsin, you can readily obtain these books. And I really uh, would recommend uh, to the listeners to obtain a book that is called The Story of Our Lady of Good Success and Novena by Father Paul Kimball. And that is the most concise and really uh, helpful account of these apparitions and the devotion so if people just Google that, it's available on Amazon. It's published by Dolorosa Press, but it's uh, available on Amazon. We'll have a link to that um, uh, on our resource list after the show. Sure. Brendan, I want to make a question about translation, the term Our Lady of Good Success. Th this is not Our Lady, uh, you know, help of the winning lottery ticket. <laughs> I mean, it, it's closer to, uh, you know, uh, by good success, I mean, it's a, a happy outcome, a right. happy ending, right. isn't so, that right? Right, Father. So actually, Our Lady was already invoked in Spain, and she was already invoked by Mother Mariana before the apparitions under Our Lady of Buen Suceso, and that refers to the actual, the birth, the successful delivery of Our Lord. And so women would invoke Our Lady under this title for a safe um, uh, delivery of their children. But then Our Lady identified herself in Spanish as Maria de Buen Suceso de la Purificación o Candelaria. So Our Lady of Good Success of the Purification or Candle Mass. And her feast day is on February 2nd, which is also the anniversary, Father, of the solemn consecration, not just a simple blessing, but the solemn consecration of the miraculous statue by the local bishop. So he took the sacred chrism and anointed the statue uh, which is reminiscent, uh, it evokes the abbatial blessing of an abbot or of an abbess. And it was Our Lady's will that she carry the crozier and uh, wear a crown as symbols of her regality and her jurisdiction over the Conceptionist Monastery. And so three times a year that statue is brought into the public church from the upper choir in May, in October, and then in January uh, for her annual novena and feast. 
And uh, Father, Our Lady asked uh, not only Mother Mariana and the nuns, but she asks each of us to invoke her under this title of Our Lady of Good Success. So again, as you mentioned, it's not to win the lottery. Um, it's not uh, so I'll get a good grade on my exam. But really that that to invoke Our Lady in this mystery that we're celebrating in, in these weeks of the incarnation of the nativity of our Lord and of his uh, presentation in the temple. And we can't forget that February 2nd is not just the commemoration of the presentation of our Lord in the temple, but also of that purification, that uh, ceremony that Our Lady underwent. And in the extraordinary form of the Mass, as it's called now in the traditional Latin Mass, February 2nd remains, as it was on on the pre-Vatican II calendar, as the Feast of the Purification of Our Lady. So many people, Father, since this rediscovery of Our Lady that was providentially meant for our own days, uh, have had numerous and extraordinary spiritual and temporal favors and graces bestowed on them um, as they have invoked Our Lady under this title. And also to uh, let's not be afraid to to learn more about her. Uh, yes, it is approved. It doesn't have the same level of approval or the uh, you know the the liturgy. Uh, for uh, Our Lady of Good Success as Our Lady of Lourdes has on February 11th and Our Lady of Fatima has on May 13th. But that is only because that these uh, precious messages and apparitions, these visitations of Our Lady uh, that are such beautiful proofs of her maternal intercession and, and her loving care for us, they were meant to be revealed and known and loved in our own times because they speak of our own times. And, and, and what a great grace. You know, as I read through these, I, I said you the, the parallel between what was spoken of in the 16th century and what's taking place in our times, it, it seems uh, un- undeniable to me. I, is there a, a resource center somewhere in the United States, some repository that we, we can direct our listeners to? Well, Father, what I would recommend, again, is if uh, our listeners can uh, uh, procure this book called The Story of Our Lady of Good Success in Novena by Father Paul Kimball, But also to go to, they can Google this, the Apostolate of Our Lady of Good Success that's based in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And uh, there are a number of books and as well uh, devotional materials, novena booklets, holy cards, rosaries, statues of Our Lady of Good Success. And um, as I've mentioned, I was privileged to go down to Ecuador, and it's a very economically, um, you know, a possible a pilgrimage to make so please if you can go there and you won't regret it and of course invoke our lady under this title of our lady of good success amen brendan young thank you for being a guest on the catholic current we hope we can have you on the air again soon thank you father god bless you i'm father robert mctagg your daily host here at the catholic current 5 to 6 p.m eastern you want to tune in monday december 31st Friends, 2018 has been a hard year for Holy Mother Church. So Monday we're going to interview uh, author and blogger Stephanie Nicholas, and we're going to ask her, Who shall defend the beaten bride of Christ? You don't want to miss it. Through the intercession of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, may God our Lord protect you from all harm and from every evil till you reach the happiness of heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.